thank you for coming. My name is Ann Hobby, and I am a proud public school parent. <laughs> Parents United for Public Schools is here this morning with a coalition of people who care very deeply about Minnesota schools. We are students, teachers, principals, superintendents, school board members, school staff members, and mostly, we are parents. We're from the metro, we're from the suburbs, and we're from greater Minnesota. We have different zip codes, and we have a single message. The education targets put forth by the House and Senate leadership this session will mean cuts to our schools and fewer opportunities for our children. Most alarming, this will happen at a time when we have a two, almost $2 billion surplus. How is this possible? Only Governor Dayton's education target recognizes the historic opportunity we have to invest in kids this session. Parents have seen <laughs> Parents like me have seen cuts as long as we can remember. My children are in high school now. When my eldest started first grade 12 years ago, we were cutting budgets. First, our schools cut assistant principals and librarians, then technology specialists and nurses. Next, we cut elementary band and orchestra programs, teaching assistants, and art. Today, in their high school, my boys' classes like pre-calculus and English have more than 40 students in them, and not enough books to go around. And school counselors? My children don't know their school counselors. Minnesota has an average, an average of 792 students to one counselor, near the bottom of the barrel in the United States. Both the House and Senate targets are inadequate. Make no mistake, if either target is passed, or even a compromise is made between the two, we will be cutting. Students around Minnesota will continue to lose opportunities, including many arts and technical, technical education programs, career programs, and many other important things that they need. Minnesota parents, like me, are tired of this cycle. It's been happening year after year. We are tired of holding silent auctions and book fairs and bake sales. We are tired of selling wrapping paper and holding raffles to fund basic needs. We are tired of volunteering in levy campaigns to beg our neighbors to raise their property taxes to try to make up the difference. We cannot simultaneously raise the bar for students and schools and continue to make cuts. Our children get one chance at this. They don't get to go back and do it again. There is no rewind. We need Minnesota's legislative leaders to do better and significantly raise the amount this state will invest in its children. Yes. Let me just say this, if not now, in a time of surplus, then when? That is the question Minnesota parents across this state are asking. Thank you. All right, well good morning everyone. My name is James Farnsworth and I'm a junior at Highland Park Senior High School in St. Paul. 
And I was asked here today to speak and represent students from all across the state of Minnesota. So two weeks ago, a group of parents at Highland formed a budget shortfall committee through our PTA. Uh, after we received news that our school is facing an upwards of $800,000 budget shortfall for next year. This means staffing cuts and cuts to beloved arts and athletics programs and activities that students all love. David, a father at our school who might be here today, uh, sent out a Facebook invitation and a group of parents got together at a local restaurant to brainstorm ideas of what they could do to help advocate for, edu uh, advocate for adequate education funding for all students. So myself and that group of parents brainstormed a social media campaign to raise awareness and engage st stakeholders, not just parents. So we created the hashtag MN Surplus for MN Students. And our mission was to capture images of students holding up a piece of paper with their future career written on it. So kind of think of like one of those chalkboard campaigns that you may have seen. So this is an example. And this is the family at Highland Park Senior High School. And it was the three of them um, listing their future careers and just making a public face to what, um, who these budget cuts directly impact. Um, so this legislative session, students' lives and futures are at stake. We are tired of budget cuts that negatively impact our learning and personal growth. The state legislature needs to put aside partisan politics and realize that especially in times of surplus, education needs to be funded fairly. I'm not a token student that was fed lines to speak to you today. I wrote this all myself. Um, and at school, even those students who I know couldn't care less about politics are starting to take notice. So our plea to Minnesota legislators is as follows. Please pass spending targets that don't cut things like clubs and athletics or the positions of our favorite teachers. Citizens and families all across the state of Minnesota absolutely cannot endure any more painful budget cuts. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's about the future of our state. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, my name is Andrew Kathlish. I'm the principal at Red Rock Elementary in Woodbury. Red Rock is part of the South Washington County School District. I'm coming to you today fresh off of a reduction process where we just increased our class sizes, eliminated our world language program in the elementary school, and reduced and froze our capital and discretionary budgets. Unfortunately, my time as a principal over the past 15 years, I've been involved in this process a number of times. The areas affected that I mentioned earlier are part of a $4.6 million reduction in our district alone. The number was originally $8 million, but thankfully our board made a commitment to change what they had set for their established parameters on their fund balance. And in, in light of um, establishing programs and keeping programs for our students reduced from eight million down to four point six million. Had we stayed at that eight million dollar target, we would have eliminated our fifth grade band program, we would have eliminated our fourth and fifth grade orchestra program, and we would have significantly reduced our early intervention reading program. With the current proposed uh, percentages on the funding for education, we will be back in the same situation next year reducing teachers to balance the budget. Ideally, approved increases on the base would be at least at the level of inflation. Yes. Yes. Without these increases, districts will continue to rely on local referendums to support programs for our students and balance our budgets. I'm sure I speak for many districts when I say how grateful we are for the support of our local communities. Ideally, we would see a shift from dis districts running referendums to balance budgets and see an increase in funding on the base from our state legislature. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Dr. Allison Labrie Whitliff, teacher and president of the Forest Lake Education Association. As a teacher for 18 years in Forest Lake, I have known only a culture of budget cuts and staff reductions. Every January as the district begins to formulate next year's budget, 
My colleagues and I wait anxiously, often predicting who will still have a job when the plan is revealed at the end of March. This year, 19 positions were cut. With each passing year, our class sizes increase as we get, say goodbye to our colleagues. Since 1991, the basic funding formula has not kept pace with inflation, and the proposed budget cuts by the House and Senate are no different. Our superintendent and school board have been fiscally responsible and worked diligently to keep teachers in the classroom, but the legislature has not provided adequate funding for our schools. Our facilities are in disrepair, our program options become more limited with each year of reductions. The talented teachers in Forest Lake and across our state are consistently asked to do more with less, and they rise to the occasion. As a teacher at the Forest Lake Area Learning Center, an alternative program for students in our district, I rely on Heidi, our full-time social worker. She dedicates her time to the social and emotional needs of our students so they stay on track toward graduation, and they do. We have been recognized by the National Dropout Prevention Center as a model program. Due to persistent budget reductions, Heidi will only be with us one day next year. I depend on Heidi, as well as those smaller class sizes, to help build strong relationships with students. As a teacher, those relationships make learning more meaningful. Smaller classes give me the freedom and time to tailor my teaching to each student. If state funding is not increased beyond the current proposals, larger class sizes and cuts to mental health support will negatively impact our students and their access to quality learning opportunities. Locally, the teachers of Forest Lake, our superintendent and school board, have worked in collaboration to ensure we provide the best possible education for our students. However, we cannot do this in a vacuum. The legislature must step up and do its part so that we and work collaboratively with the educators in the state so we can provide quality educational opportunities for all students in Minnesota. With an almost two... <laughs> like Anne, I ask you, with an almost $2 billion budget surplus, if not now, when? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ed Harris. I'm the superintendent in Chatfield, Minnesota, which is a pretty typical rural Minnesota district. We have about 900 kids, K through 12, and are about 15 miles southeast of Rochester. You've heard from several others already about what they see in their schools and communities every day and year after year. In a minute, I'm going to share with you what the state budget situation could mean for Chatfield. But first, I want to go over the education budget targets for the House, Senate, and Governor. As you can see from this chart, only Governor Dayton's education budget recognizes the historic opportunity we have to invest in kids. His budget puts 37 percent of the nearly $2 billion surplus towards education. By comparison, the E-12 education budget historically gets 42 percent of the general fund. Even if 42 percent of the surplus went to students, there should be plenty left for colleges, tax relief, budget reserves, and all the other priorities people talk about at the Capitol. For superintendents, these education targets are start numbers on a page. They represent real opportunities lost or gained for our students and their families, especially in greater Minnesota. If you lay off teachers in a small town, they will likely move away and not come back. If class sizes grow in an elementary school and key programs are reduced, it's all the more reason for young families to live somewhere else. When levies go up, every property owner feels it. In towns like Chatfield, cuts like these ripple through the entire community and take years to recover from. For example, let me tell you about Chatfield's elementary school. Two years ago, Chatfield's elementary was labeled as a continuous improvement school by the MDE based on the state's MMR rating system because of low test scores and a persistent wide achievement gap. That label is for schools in the bottom 25% of the state. We responded by retooling our teacher development structure and accelerating the rollout of two new programs, Action 100 and Reading Research. We emphasized reading for every student, used data more efficiently, and partnered with parents. We also gave students who struggled the most with the reading help that they needed. So what happened? Last year, Chadfield's 2014 MMR score 
ranked in the top 2% in the state compared to every other elementary school. <laughs> of which there are over 2,000. We think Chatfield will do very well again this year, but I don't know how long that success will last. Our district is a responsible steward of the taxpayers' money. We try to keep our expenses down and our levies below the state average. This year, we cut $225,000 out of our budget to bring in, into balance. We were able to make most of those cuts in operations and not programs or staff. Now, Minnesota has a nearly $2 billion budget surplus, but Chatfield, in Chatfield, we're still talking about two more years of cuts that will now further harm programs, students, and staff. Next year, our inflationary expenditures are expected to go up by nearly $300,000. We're budgeting for a 1% increase in the general education aid formula, because so far that's probably the most uh, publicized number there is, uh, which for us is about only $53,000 in new revenue. That means we're spending reserve funds as well, to pre as well as preparing to cut next year's budget by $200,000 and another $200,000 the year after that. We already started cutting teachers and reducing programs this spring. Do you know what that means? the school that was at the bottom 25% two years ago and climbed into the top 2% based on last year's MMR data. Classes and class size will be increased next year and the year after that until they reach nearly 30 in two grades in our elementary. And both of those critical support programs that I mentioned earlier that were so key in our success have already begun to start to be reduced. Action 100 and reading research. And if nothing changes, we will likely have to ask our taxpayers to increase the revenue from our operating levy, which will be a challenge. Cuts to school budgets touch everyone in rural Minnesota. In Chatfield, we built a highly effective system to improve the educational outcomes for our students based on what the state was requiring of us. Now we have to begin dismantling it due to budget targets that will lead to another inadequate increase in the general education funding formula for our district. We need a 3% formula increase each year, at least for the next biennium, if we were to have any hope of achieving financial stability and maintaining what has proven so effective in raising student achievement and closing the educational achievement gap for our kids in our school district. Thank you. Good morning. I am Kevin Donovan, a member of the Monomedi School Board and president of the Minnesota School Boards Association. We represent the 332 districts across our state. You've heard a lot of numbers, percentages, formula this, formula that, but the takeaway, I think, from this entire message today is these young people standing with us. This is what we're really talking about. And this is our future, our legacy, and we need to make sure we do right for them. Today I stand with our allies in education, supporting Governor Dayton's $695 million budget target for education. Governor Dayton wisely devotes nearly 40% of the uh, surplus to E-12 funding. The governor's budget gives school board members their best chance to maintain and enhance learning opportunities for our children. Minnesota's competitive edge has been and needs to be a highly educated workforce. Without ad adequate funding, we run the real risk of losing that edge for generations to come. With a nearly $2 billion budget surplus projected for the next biennium, school board members had hoped that there would be adequate and equitable funding for every public school student. That hope was dashed by the inadequate funding targets proposed by the House and the Senate. Minnesota school board members bear the ultimate responsibility for school districts' budgets and providing the educational foundation for our state's 850,000 public school students. 850,000, that's a big, big number. We only have a small percentage here today. <laughs> 
Public school boards need predictable and stable funding in order to close achievement gaps, maintain smaller class sizes, and help prepare our students for a college and career. If the legislature does not provide adequate funding, there will be adverse consequences for public schools and their communities. The vision and goal set by our school boards will go unfulfilled. Many school boards are and school districts are already experiencing budget cuts based on low state funding projections for the next biennium. The Anoka Hennepin School District, which educates 40,000 students, is already bracing for budget cuts. In 2016, they're projecting an $8 million shortfall, and in 2017, a $17 million shortfall. The board chair for Anoka Hennepin equates a $1 million cut with approximately 20 teaching positions. You can do the math. Likewise, the Burnsville Egan Savage School District, with 10,000 students, is planning to cut 68 positions next year. These stories are repeated time and time again all across the state. In Matamidi, we've cut 10 out of the, uh, the last 11 years. The low-hanging fruit is gone, it's been eaten, and now we need to grow. We need to grow some more here. So, <laughs> It's the legislature's constitutional, constitutional obligation to provide adequate and equitable funding. Yes. The legislature expects school boards to meet the goals in the world's best workforce, mm -hmm. to integrate technology into our learning, and to have all of our students reading by third grade. But the House and Senate education budget targets would undermine our ability to carry out these goals. Closing the achievement gap and giving all Minnesota students a first-class education requires sustainable investments. We have a wonderful a great opportunity with a two billion dollar surplus to do this work. We need to get to a place where funding for education is a priority and as they say in geometry a given. We need to have that. We have a great opportunity to do this work. I stand today with parents, students, the reason why we're here, teachers, superintendents, and school board members. We stand united asking the legislature to adopt a higher budget target for public education. I ask you, if not now, when? when? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mary Ciccone. I'm with Parents United. I'm happy to answer your questions, but I would suggest that the people who really have the fabulous stories are all around you. So they're willing to be interviewed, and they're the ones who I would suggest you ask the questions of. But if you have any technical questions or anything of us, Parents United is going to be delivering a letter to both uh, Speaker Doubt and Majority Leader Bach right after this a press conference, and I'm sure we'll have a few parents with us. So, any questions for our speakers? If not, please take advantage of the people that are in this room that got themselves here, which is not difficult with, oh, it's not easy with little children. So, we thank them. The room is hot, but if you'd like to speak, any questions? Yeah, could a principal or maybe a superintendent talk a little bit about a big chunk of the governor's budget proposal is I can speak to that uh, from my district's perspective uh, briefly. Uh, I appreciate and certainly support um, early childhood education. I don't think there's any doubt about that in the room. However, the current plan is pretty broad and doesn't allow for districts that may have already progressed to the point um, to what the vision is currently at the state level um, to do anything different with the funding. In our particular case, 
uh, we've spent some time, and I mentioned earlier about two programs that we are implementing heavily. We drove that all the way down into our preschool. We train our preschool teachers with the same rigor as our K-6 through teachers under the same program. Um, they're in PLCs, the reading curriculum is driven down to the same level, and we basically are treating them as an extension of our current D12 program. They're it. Um, so in our case, uh, the, the, we have gone the distance um, that is being, I think, looked at um, by the state of Minnesota, but we're suffering elsewhere. The, the structural constructs of our district's uh, operational system is suffering. And, you know, unfortunately, the example I gave earlier, we're going to have to start taking apart the supplemental programs that have filled the gaps that we've been asked to fill over the last 10 years. Um, it's working, um, but we're not going to be able to sustain it. And that is a sad, sad feeling. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I think I can speak for a couple of people here, but I'd let them speak themselves. The problem is that unless you have the dollars to do the programs, terrific programs can be in the bills. But without funding, they can't be implemented. That's the problem. We heard bills this year, tremendous bills with tremendous ideas, all with price tags. We get to the end result, we have the great ideas, and not the dollars to pay for them. More than anything, it's superintendents. I'm the superintendent of St. Paul Public Schools, and I tell you what, we are lot. We would like all, as everybody in the world, but the reality is we want flexibility of how we can use the money because every district is different. I would be very selfish to tell you that I don't want the four-year-old program because we do have 1,800 students in the four-year-old program that is sponsored by our taxpayers. But I do know that in other parts of the, in the cities as well as in the urban education part of Minnesota, those are not the essential needs. The essential needs is to keep qualified teachers who can get a decent pay that they're willing to go and work in a small school district. And that is an investment. And I don't know if we all have in really point out the fact that we're investing or trying to invest in transportation and bridges and more educators and, and have more qualified students for the next generation. But without an education, those investments will never get there. So we are asking for what it is the basic of what we all believe and stay in this country, which is the public education works for all, and it needs to be part of the Constitution. To answer your question, you had a very specific question. There was a great bill to increase counselors in schools, and there was no fiscal note to it. Mm -hmm. So what we would be doing is uh, requiring school districts to use dollars that are already being used to purchase more counselors. We need the counselors, but we need, as the superintendent said, the flexibility to do what's necessary. Other questions? If not, I thank you all for coming. Any parents who are interested in meeting with the conferees, we have their, um, they're aware that we are in the building and they're aware that you're here and if you would like to visit with them, uh, their, their uh, office numbers are on a piece of paper over there. Those of you for press, you can get a copy of the letter that we're delivering to leadership. Heidi's got that over there. Anyone who would like to write a note and we will be happy to deliver it to any conferees. We've got paper and pens and all of that here. So thank you very, very much for coming.